Good evening. How are you all this evening? Great, great. Um, I want to welcome you to our third annual Falcon Talk event. Uh, and it, as each time we offer an opportunity for our um, entrepreneurial learning initiative, um, engage students, faculty, and staff to, to share their narrative, the, 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 the field gets larger. So it only, uh, in, I would say, confirms and affirms the work that we're doing in terms of the levels of interest, the broad scope, uh, we're all impacted by the narratives that people share at this podium, but it also inspires us to look forward to the next year. So we're very happy that you're here tonight to share what you have learned as a result of your experiences with the entrepreneurial education and training experience here at Daytona State College. Very happy to, to see that you are emboldened to step up and tell your story because you know that your story empowers others. And so kudos to you for taking that journey and looking over your shoulder and bringing others with you. Uh, I was reading uh, uh, Brenny Brown. She's uh, one of our um, more prominent writers about empowerment. And we have a lot of her work in our collection at the Entrepreneurial Resource Center. And one of my favorite reference quotes from her work is that when you, when you own your narrative, right? When you own your narrative, you get to write the ending. So keep that in mind, okay? That's so empowering, and that's what you're doing tonight. You're owning the narrative, and it's gonna be very clear to all of us where you're going. So welcome again to our third annual event. It grows, um, the, the roster of speakers grows each year. We started uh, this event in a classroom setting, and so we see the potential for uh, this kind of expansion. Um, the entrepreneurial education and training experience at Daytona State College consists of many components, one being the entrepreneurial mindset opportunity initiative, where many of you have taken classes and, in, and certified in the entrepreneurial learning initiative, right? So you have that mindset certification. Other parts of the entrepreneurial experience include the resource center, and many of you have frequented the resource center, gathering materials, working with our entrepreneurs and residents, uh, receiving mentoring uh, experiences or direction. Uh, other areas include the events that we host in your out of your classes, the chat and choose and the dine and discover. So as a part of your curriculum, we've invited entrepreneurs to your classroom to reinforce the concepts that have been taught, the concepts that you've been learning. So this, this piece is really just larger than one event. But the Falcon Talk is the crown, is the jewel in the crown. Because you can best demonstrate the success of an initiative um, when the students tell the story. So we're very pleased that you see this as a serious endeavor, as an important step. And so I think that um, you being here tonight continues to affirm the work that we're doing at Daytona State College. So I wanna thank you for that. So at this time, because I'm not a speaker, so I'm gonna stop. Um, at this time, I want to introduce uh, Teresa Rand, who is our principal entrepreneur in residence. She's been with us for about three years now. And Teresa, you all know, has been uh, instrumental behind the momentum that you all have experienced relative to engaging with entrepreneurs and also preparing for events like this, um, the Falcon Talk event. So I want to bring Teresa to the podium, and we will get this evening started. So thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Dr. Weems. So who's ready to talk? I'm looking at the first two rows and I should see 14 heads nodding. <laughs> because we have 14 presenters tonight and we have a mixture of faculty, students, 
and alumni. We're going to hear from two alumni, I think three alumni, but two by video tonight that took the time after graduating from Daytona State, moving on to their career, to come back and say thank you Daytona State and here's some things I've learned. If you are not familiar with the Ice House curriculum, there's a lot of information on these two tables as you enter. We will have an intermission so you can go and check all of that out, but each presenter tonight will be speaking on one of these eight words on the post posters here that you can see. Now we may hear some words spoken more than once and that's okay because what we ask everybody to do is look at these eight words and pick out one that speaks to you, that you can tell a personal story about. So that's what they're doing tonight and it takes a lot of courage to do that, to take a word and put it in your story what it means to you and why it's important to you. I've had the privilege of reading all of the speeches and you are in for a treat. So sit back, I would say relax, but I want you to really pay attention. And if a speaker gets nervous, that would be the time that you maybe make eye contact and nod at them or say, you've got it or we're here, whatever. We have some seasoned speakers, but we have some new speakers. And I think every speaker has a little bit of nerves no matter how seasoned you are. So please just lean forward and give them great, good energy and vibes. And to help you with that, tonight we have, we affectionately call him the voice of God because he was a radio announcer in a past lifetime. He is now the vice president of resource development for our Daytona Regional Chamber of Commerce, also a great friend of mine. And he will be coming up tonight to tell you a little bit about the flow of the program and what his role will be. So Kent, Mr. Ken Phelps. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. That was, I appreciate the response. Thank you. Active, engaged audience is what we want here tonight. So the first thing I would like to do is to encourage all of our speakers tonight and tell you that you've done an incredibly brave thing. And I want to encourage you to really lean into the moment because public speaking on a list of fears is up there with like death and spiders. So your role tonight as the audience is to encourage these folks who have taken this step, and as Dr. Weems said, own your narrative. Nobody knows your story like you do, so just be comfortable in, in telling it. Um, I'm looking forward to introducing everybody tonight. We're gonna have a very kind of quick pace of the program. We will have a 10 minute break in the middle that will allow you to get some refreshments, check out some of the, the information we've got tonight. Um, but I would, I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment and our role as the Daytona Regional Chamber of Commerce and supporting the business community. We're very excited that Daytona State College has integrated entrepreneurial education and training into the curriculum and, and in a number of disciplines. In part because when you embark on a career, whether you're taking a position within a company or starting your own, entrepreneurial thinking will carry you a very long way and it will benefit you not only professionally but the organization you're with and the people around you. So with that, who's ready to hear some fantastic speeches tonight? Well, come on now. I know there's more people in the room than that. Who's ready to hear some good speeches tonight? All right. This will be the last, well, not quite the last. It'll be one, probably one other opportunity that you'll see me in front of the camera tonight. The rest of the night, I'm going to be the man behind the curtain. And as you said on the Wizard of Oz, never mind the man behind the curtain. So don't turn around. Just enjoy the speakers that are coming up here tonight. All right, you guys ready? All right, we're going to welcome our first speaker to the stage this evening. He is a member of the Daytona State College staff as the Veterans Service Coordinator. Please put your hands together for Charles Fordham. Good evening, everyone. All right. My name is Charles Fordham, uh, coordinator for Daytona State College Veterans Services, better known as Chuck. Um, I'm up here in reference to speaking but I'll be speaking on all eight life lessons learned very briefly. And real quick about me, um, I have a total of 22 years of military service between the United States Army and the Florida Army National Guard. Okay, and thank you. <laughs> I also, uh, I retired as a captain. I've also did 21 years with the Daytona Beach Police Department, whereas I retired as a lieutenant, okay. 
I worked a bit with the school board at Atlanta High School in Port Orange where I coached football and basketball. Then I came to Daytona State College. I worked in campus safety for oh, about three, four years, and now I'm in veteran services. So uh, these eight have pertained to me, but what they also have done, uh, Ms. D was giving me a little bit more motivation. So I'm not one of the young traditionals, but I thought, you know, thought about it. Well, you know, there's a couple of things I've been thinking about doing. Now I'm going over the fence to do them. So with that, I'll just move on. My first one is um, opportunity. And my, to you is, um, if we look at the ice house where Uncle Clee was able to uh, recognize the opportunity for the people in that area that needed ice, during the day, need the ice for their work. And we look at um, uh, what he decided to do, which we'll talk about in a minute. But he took that opportunity. Then he took another opportunity to uh, open a garage, OK? Um, because he saw something else he could do. So my thing is, even with me, as I went through my two careers, if you, if you hear that, what is that? Opportunity knocking. Okay, a couple of times I didn't open the door. And then when I started to open the door, I started moving in rank. Okay, uh, started getting in different areas in the military, getting in different areas of the police department. Okay, so you hear those opportunities, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you right now, take them. Okay, um, knowledge. Uh, when I was growing up, everyone said education is key. And if you come along, you find out knowledge is key. And you put the both together, and you have education and knowledge that will get you along, that will help you. I know we talk about entrepreneurship, but with this, I kept talking about just life and careers. Because nobody thought this young boy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, or be training a unit to go to war. Nobody thought this young boy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I'd be running the whole city of Daytona Beach. Okay, you got to, you got to, you got to take it. You got to take it. Get that knowledge. Get that education. It's gonna be rough sometimes. Got to back up. Got to keep forward. Choices. You're gonna have choices in life. I had them. Should I quit? Should I move on? Should I do something else? Okay, excuses are tools of the incompetent. And those who specialize in excuses seldom specialize in anything else. So you got to go ahead and fight through the moments. Okay, you got to fight through the moments. You have choices. If there's somebody you need to talk to, talk to them. Okay, but you have choices. So let's make those choices to continue on. So one day you could be telling somebody you're retired, you move on, you become a mentor to someone else. Okay, very important. Action. What action are you going to take? Um, you know, me and myself, I had to take action. What I'm going to do? I hate to say it, working at a uh, institution of higher learning, but I hated school. Okay, I hated it. All right, I was it. Last one to register, first one to go, all right? But I found out you need that knowledge, you need that education. So I had to take Aisha. My Aisha was going back to school, going back to Bethune, couldn't get, get my degree in criminal justice. Okay, what action are you going to take? What are you going to do in life to continue on? A lot of changes going on, cell phones, technology, computers, you know, we had to mail a letter to someone. You know, we had, we had to write a note and leave it. You don't have to do that nowadays. Okay, but what action are you going to take to continue on for your goals and objectives in life? Um, persistent. Okay, I put perseverance and persistence together. Okay, in the, in, um, in the book, Who Owns the Ice House? If you see what the author said, when they looked at persistence, okay, bottom line was work hard and don't give up. 
okay? Work hard and don't give up. There's some days I had to work 16 days straight. Okay, there were days uh, when I was in the police academy. I was in the National Guard. I was a security guard. You know, I, I, I never saw the sun rise because I was always going somewhere. All right, those are things you have to do. Things I had to do, I had to be persistent. I had to persevere. I had to get through it. Okay, and even when I was on the police department and in the National Guard, there were times I had to work and work and work. If anybody remember the old spring break, late 80s and 90s, okay, MTV, BCR. Okay, then I got done with all that. I had to train out in Fort Bliss, Texas. All right, you have to persevere. You have to be persistent if you want to make it. All right, excuses won't get it. Next one. A word everybody likes is wealth. Who would like to be wealthy? Who would like to have a million dollars in the bank? You know, I got a couple of hands, I see you. All right? But my wealth is this, real quick. Uh, being able to live every day without being in debt. Uh, on money and being able to pay my bills on time. All right, being able to, uh, you know, buy some things when I need when I need them. That is my wealth. Okay, what is your wealth? What will run you? As Uncle Cleve said in the in the book, "Who Owns the Ice House?" When he was talking to his nephew, he said, "Me and May could buy what we want, you know, when we need it or when we want it." We don't have to borrow money, and we don't owe a dime. That was his wealth. He was good to go. Okay, what is your wealth? How do you look at life? Um, community. Uh, when I first saw community, it kind of threw me. Because like me, I volunteered. I've coached uh, Pop Warner football and cheer for 15 years. I coached Pal basketball for eight years. I've helped out here. I've helped out there. But in the book, community, he's talking about um, choosing the right friends. That is very important. I've been blessed. I've been lucky. I've had good people around me my whole life. My friends and I, we put each other in check. We police each other. Hey, you've had enough. Hey, don't do that. Uh, we're not going to do that. Okay? And you can have fun, even as an adult, okay? I never had on a pair of handcuffs. The first I had on a pair of handcuffs, I was in the police academy, going through training, okay? Did I talk to the Fort Lauderdale police a couple of times? Yes, I did, okay? I'm no angel. You don't see no wings on my back, all right? Hey, but be smart. Make the right decisions out there. Because believe it or not, you can talk to me later, you'll see it again. When you put in a job application, when you, when you put in for references. Okay? And last but not least is brand. Uh, as, the, I, as the book talk about um, uh, a brand. Okay, what is your brand in life? Martin Luther King did a speech with, uh, what is your blueprint in life? There's an NFL Hall of Famer, Ray Lewis, that does a speech. And when he did his speech, he talked about your, the day you was born and the day you die. And in between that, that's that little dash. All right? That's your brand in life. That little dash is your brand in life, your, your blueprint. So in the book, Who Owns the Ice House, they talk about your brand. Is your word your bond? Is your word your honor? As an entrepreneur, dealing with customer service, dealing with people, okay? You want to make a brand. You want to have a blueprint. You want to have a good dash. But you, what you don't want to do is be branded. Branded is totally opposite. Is your word your bond? Can we count on you? Are you going to be there? You know? Entrepreneurs, when you say you're going to have that sale 
till Saturday. Don't take the sell down sign on Friday. You know, your word is your bond, ladies and gentlemen. No matter what it is. I've already told uh, uh, Dr. Weems and Ms. D that when they have their event here May 2nd and 3rd, I'll be there with them. My word is my bond. Your word is your bond. The book, Who Owns the Ice House, has been very inspirational and motivational for me. And I appreciate you all taking out the time to listen. Thank you. Our next speaker is a student in music production and technology. Please welcome to the stage, Stephanie Ann Ross. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie. I'm a student here in the music production program. And um, just to like real quickly go into it, when I first got here, I was you know at a low point in my life, and I decided to go back into college after actually believe it or not I was I dropped out of college for like five years straight like and now I'm like 30 and I'm about to graduate here in May so <laughs> all right so I uh, my word is action so when it when you want to be successful you have to take action like, one, you can't just sit around and just expect things to fall in your lap, because that's not how life goes. Like, I learned that the hard way. And, uh, like, I learned that the hard way throughout my life, throughout real-life situations, throughout DSC. And, you know, sometimes that reality hits you in the face. Anytime that I wanted something bad enough, I had to take action and pursue that opportunity. Like, for example... When I found out the school had DJs, I really wanted to be a DJ at Daytona State. I went for it. I was like, I had to know who, who had the information, who was like the person to talk to, and I got it. And I've been now DJing for Daytona State for about like a year or so, like two years now. And that's what happens when you take action. And, um, and like also like college will give you the skills that you need for the real world like you said entrepreneur and the, those skills will help you be successful and achieve like and what what you do with those skills is what makes it or breaks it and that's how you survive in the real world especially in the business world and you got to be persistent don't give up don't take no for an answer and uh there will be times, though, when you will get, like, rejection. Like, somebody will just slam that door in your face, and, oh, you're going to be defeated. You're gonna, it's going to hurt. You're going to, everything in you is just, you're going to be angry about it. But you have to get back up and dust your feet off, and you'll be like, you know what? I can find a better opportunity. That's fine. I'm going to go look somewhere else. So you just continue looking, and you just got to push it and push it and push it. And um, like I said, it's about action and taking action, you know, because actions speak louder than words. And no matter how many times somebody tells you that they will do something for you, doesn't mean they will. I also had to learn that hard lesson. And it definitely, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. <laughs> One thing I've learned in life is that people will not do, for thing, do things for you or help you until actions prove otherwise. And this works both ways, not just on that person, but on you too. Because, you know, you got to prove yourself. You know, you got to show your credibility to make them trust you and so on and so forth. And you can't let people take you for granted because there are people out there that will take you for granted and take advantage of you and you got to watch out for that. And, you know, don't be afraid to let people know that you want actions because there are some scam artists out, the, out there that will sit there and tell you, paint this big picture about how, oh, I can do this for you. And, you know, sometimes that's not always true. And, um, you know, the more you do this, the more you realize how much more successful you will be and the likelihood of surrounding yourself with people, better people, who will not only lift you up, but will help you along the way. 
Be careful about who you surround yourself with. Surround yourself with people who mean what they say. Surround yourself with people who take action on success. I chose this word action because throughout my career, I've learned a lot about people throughout the walks of life. And there are people who just talk a lot, but then there are people who will actually help you, that care about your success, that want to get you where you want to go. And those are the people you want to surround yourself with. And, you know, be watchful of the bad ones, but cherish the good, good ones. Just hold those good people to your heart. Those are the people who help you and be successful in whatever you are doing in life. The more you surround yourself with good people who actually care about helping you, the more successful you will be. Remember, you have to work hard and prove your worth. Actions do work both ways, but always remember, do not give up. I believe in you. I believe in all of you, actually. I think all of you could be very successful, if, especially when you fo focus on those action, actions. Sorry. Remember, actions speak louder, action speaks louder than words. Always remember that. Our third speaker of the evening is also a staff member here at Daytona State College, a work experience coordinator and instructor in the College of Technology. Please welcome to the stage, Faith Bryant. Hello, everyone. So I'm here as a staff member, but I'm also an alumni. I received my Associates of Arts degree from Daytona State, as well as a Bachelor's of Applied Science in Supervision and Management. And so as Ken said, um, many people have a fear of public speaking. I always say I don't until I get on stage. <laughs> so do you remember when you received your driver's permit, when you got the permission to learn how to drive? Did you study a book or did you study online? Well, I'm old enough to where we studied a book. We got a book from the, the Florida Department of Motor Vehicles and I studied for a few months, kind of like a semester. And then I went and took the written test. And I passed it on the first try because I applied myself. I studied hard because I wanted the independence of driving. So what do you think happened after I got my, drive, my learner's permit? Do you think I immediately got on I-95 by myself and started driving? Would you want to drive on the road with a bunch of people who only passed a written exam? Well, my husband and I were in Atlanta this past weekend, and that's what it feels like on every Atlanta expressway, is that people just read, passed a written exam. But I digress. So I did not get right on the road. I had to have someone show me. So having passed a written exam does not make one an experienced driver. Driving makes one an experienced driver. And that brings me to my topic for this Falcon Talk, which is knowledge. And as it relates to the entrepreneurial mindset, there's a card there for knowledge, but I'll read it. It says, curiosity and the pursuit of knowledge are critical aspects to an entrepreneurial mindset. And rather than viewing now learning as a one-time event or allowing others to define their educational limitations, Entrepreneurs become self-directed, lifelong learners who seek knowledge in a variety of ways. Now, I've always had an entrepreneurial mindset. Well, I wasn't born with it, but by the age of four. By the age of four, I started working with my dad. My dad has operated a lawn service down in Broward County, Florida all my life. And he obviously paid no attention to child labor laws. <laughs> because as early as I can remember, my sisters and I would get on the truck and go to work with him. And we would actually work. We would pull weeds, we would water plants, we would put um, flyers in mailboxes, which is illegal, by the way. <laughs> and our job was also to look cute and sweet so that people would hire my dad. So since the age of four, I've been a spokesmodel. <laughs> my dad never earned a high school diploma, but he has been my greatest teacher. 
My dad was the Uncle Cleve of our neighborhood. I've watched him negotiate rates, upsell customers, deliver customer service, and work harder than anybody I've ever seen. I saw what it took to be an entrepreneur through him, and I wanted no parts of it. But I could not escape the mindset. It's been ingrained in me. Now, let's get back to the driving analogy. We've all determined that we hate driving in Atlanta traffic, and we would not want to drive on a road with people who have only passed a written exam. So in the same way, as an entrepreneur, it is important that we don't stop at book knowledge. My personal model for myself is never stop learning. But learning takes many forms. Reading and studying gives us factual knowledge. Doing gives us applied knowledge. And applied knowledge looks like clock hours in the cosmetology program or clinical hours in the nursing program. I'm the work experience coordinator, so I'll make a plug for internships for the School of Computer Science or good old fashioned volunteering or public service. We are in the age of knowledge. It is everywhere. But applied knowledge takes us from knowing to doing from a student to a professional. Thank you. Our fourth speaker of the evening is a student in business management operations. Please welcome Michael Schofield. I got horsepower in my veins right now. Appreciate very, appreciate all y'all coming out. Um, all right, so I'm a very quiet guy, but I'm gonna take all y'all into my world real quick. Eight words are presented in front of us. And one of these words spoke to me heavy. <clears throat> that word was persistence. That word persistence spoke to my life. So I got no other way to share it with you but to tell you the story about my life. Let's start off with my mother. My mother started off with persistence. Being a single mother taking me to Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, to the county jail just to visit my father. Our first bonding moments with my father was through visitation. So it was hard on her, working at Burger King, KFC, two jobs, double shifts, living in a trailer home, raising two kids. My dad in and out in the streets, dope boy, trying to find his way as a young man. Mom was 20, dad was 21. Frustration, domestics, drugs, alcohol, you name it. I've seen it. I've been through it. Persistence kept my dad going. After divorce, I moved in with my dad at the age of 10 years old in Atlanta, Georgia. That's when I got to see the real world. 10 years old, I thought I was grown. <laughs> I got kicked out of my mama house at 10 because I woke up one morning and asked her why she didn't cook breakfast. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, y'all. Right. <laughs> she slapped me across my head so fast and put me on that bus. <clears throat> But my life was going downhill. I was 10 years old, staying out 10 o'clock at night, running from police, hanging out with the wrong crowd, trying to be like my pops. So I got up to Atlanta, moved in with him, got the real world experience, what we've been going through. One bed apartment, him hustling back and forth, getting denied jobs, getting denied from Taco Bell just because he's a two-time felon. I got to see life really early, and through persistence was the key in code. We got kicked out, uh, eviction notice, that led to us leaving in the car, living on the street. I got out of school, I went to a charter school. Got out of school, I'm sleeping in the laundry mat room, waiting for him to get out and see what we're gonna do. But persistence kept us going. What's persistence? The course of continuance through difficulty of opposition. Consistency is key on how you can be persistent. Persistence was embedded into me from my family. Persistence was embedded to my grandmother, and she passed that down to us later on as me realizing as a, as a young man now after she passed away in 2018. My grandmother was a honcho of everything. Everybody. All five grandkids would be dropped off to her house on the weekends. We wake up off sleeping off the floor. We wake up. 
all hot meals are already ready. All you gotta do is go brush your teeth and sit down. She never missed. When I tell you she never missed, turkey, bacon, eggs and grits, never missed. And you better go to church, 11 o'clock. <laughs> she was always persistent all the way through her death. Our last time even conversating on the phone, we was in two different states. I was here in Florida, she was there in Pennsylvania. My last time hearing my grandmother's voice was through a prayer. I was going through hard things as a young man, having a place to stay on my own for the first time, going through struggling with rent, and just got kicked out of playing football, trying to find myself and figure things out. And she prayed over my head, and you know, next couple of days she was gone. But she stayed persistent, and she stayed consistent with what she did, and that was being a woman of God. Leading all the way to me. <sighs> Seeing it all. Seeing families torn apart because of poverty. Seeing friends on the same school bus with me in the grave or in jail doing 10 plus years. Seeing how I was so different, but yet was being so distracted by so many things that could have turned me left or turned me right, but made me keep going on this certain path where to, I'm in the stage of my life now where I'm standing in front of you being an owner in my own company, my own brand. <clears throat> Persistence is the only thing I know right now. When I started my company, Lotus LTO, which is my clothing brand I have on, which stands for Live Over the Unique Struggles, I told myself, like, dang, how did I even come up with that? And I'm like, I've been through so many struggles, it's like, that's all I knew, and I'm a product of my brand, but I wanted to represent struggles the right way. I wanted to turn struggles to flowers. So within that, I said, I'm gonna take this ride, I'm gonna take this journey, the minute I created my brand and my logo. And I've been through, excuse my language, I've been through hell and back with this logo. Hell and back. And persistence, reoccurred in my life again. It just kept coming to me. Just, there'll be moments where I'll be doing a show and I get a phone call, somebody passed away. There's moments where I made the news twice in the last two years and get another phone call, somebody passed away. There'll be moments where I'll share my achievements with my parents, my father, and it wouldn't hit him with any excitement because of struggles that he was going through. All these things I had to take, punches after punches after punches after punches. But I knew to be persistent. I knew to keep going. Even last year, I was doing independent shows, touring around, going to Dallas, Texas. Never left the South. I mean, that's the South too, but you know, it's a little farther west out. But never left, scared out my mind, didn't know what I was gonna do. I had 200 bucks in my pocket, got on the road, made it there. Made it there had the time of my life, executed on a lot of plans, received a lot of grants through taking that step forward for my business, for my brand, for my dreams. And I just wanna say persistence is embedded into my spirit and through in persistence, all of you guys can make it. Through persistence, you will strive. Through persistence, you will keep it going. Through persistence, you will smile, and no matter how it goes, stay ten toes, and the sun rises on the other side. Our fifth speaker of the evening is a physics student here at Daytona State College. Please put your hands together for Marie Smolchewski. Hello. Um I'm actually an astrophysics student, and um, I'm here. Uh, my actual interest is um, theoretical structures in cosmology. Um, but I chose the word knowledge because that is a very dear word to me, and there's a lot of um, depth to that word that I found in my life. Um, so I think what I'm going to say, it might sound impersonal, but it's really very, very personal for me. It's come from life experiences and this is everything that's important to me. Knowledge is a light that illuminates the darkness of ignorance. All of us carry the darkness of unknowing 
until the light of thought awakens inside us. The acquisition of knowledge is made possible by this breaking dawn of awareness, of sudden curiosity, of a driven desire to understand more than we have ever known before. As beings of higher faculties, we possess the ability to lift ourselves out of the prim our primal and instinctual natures into closer observation and more profound appreciation of everything around us. Carl Jung said, as far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. We were not meant to merely exist. We were meant to live. Understanding liberates us. Think of the things we have been capable of building from the processes of the human mind illuminated by knowledge. These are technical prosthetic extensions of our thought and curiosity, like microscopes or telescopes or even the internet. And these things make prosthetic knowledge, extended knowledge, possible. We have used our own minds to create tools to transcend ourselves. And in so doing, we've created an infinite feedback loop for learning. In a Google search and a few fractions of a second, we have access to an encyclopedia of information that never would have been accessible physically before, just at our fingertips. Consider the word knowledge as opposed to merely information. Knowledge implies the integration and understanding within a conscious being that has interpreted mere information. Knowledge is, then, an essential, central part of humanness. Knowledge exists at the heart of the search for truth and purpose. There is an inextricable relationship between our discovery of the world and the discovery of ourselves, the discovery of the outer versus the inner. With perspectives from accumulated knowledge, we begin constructing our own convictions. Knowledge is the eye of desire and can become the pilot of the soul. This was said by prolific American historian and philosopher, Will Durant. From our sense of self in the world, evolves an ultimate sense of purpose. Purpose, then, gives us a call to action, a sense of agency. I might be biased, but the cosmic perspective holds implicitly our most profound sense of self. In the 1940s, our knowledge of, the, of astronomical optics coalesced in, into an instrument the size of a warehouse room called, you might know it, the Hubble Space Telescope. An inscription by journalist Ross Anderson tells us, the Hubble has given us nothing less than an ontological awakening a forceful reckoning of all, of everything that is. Through the sheer aesthetic force of its discoveries, Hubble distilled the complex abstractions of astrophysics into singular expressions of color and light. When we explore the universe, taking the complex abstractions of astrophysics, which are the accomplishments of all of our knowledge, and apply them to capture the vastness of the universe into a work of art we can access and contemplate and reflect back in on ourselves. We have done something profound. The poet William Blake said, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. These words transcend disciplines as they are not a description of any science, art, or humanities alone, but rather a convergence point for all of them where we have 
an opportunity for deeper understanding. Only by revealing the dark and discovering more inside the ordinary do we uncover the unknown in exchange for possibility, for finding patterns, for making connections across disciplines, for being inspired, and ultimately discovering meaning that can be used to change the world. What more is the feeling of being alive than the emotions inspired of inspired awe and wonder that you get from gaining knowledge? What more impetus do we need to discover than from this? Our lives are an ongoing, unfolding process of continual discovery. We need to do, oh, we exist as unique chances to understand and create more from that understanding. We need to do what makes us feel most alive because what the world needs is people who have come to life. Knowledge gives us perspectives, conviction, purpose, agency, and inspiration, all towards the ability to identify problems and develop solutions, both human and universal. Thank you. Our next speaker is a member of Daytona State College's administration, the Vice President of Enrollment Management. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Eric Diaquino. So I'm first generation at, well, pretty much everything. So I was the first in my family to complete and get a bachelor's degree, first to get a master's degree, first and probably the only one to get a PhD. So, um, but there's more and stuff, and, and, and I know many of this resonates with the folks in the audience. I'm a first generation uh, in, in my family being born in the United States, and the first generation to have English be the primary language taught to me. I never knew what I wanted to do when I was growing up. I remember in sixth grade, I sat down, in some, sixth or seventh grade, I sat down, and I was sitting at a desk, I was in the middle, and they were just asking, and I said, all I know is that I want to dress up for work and wear a shirt and tie and sign my name a lot. <laughs> well, for all intents and purposes, I'm a success, especially by my sixth grade definition. Uh, but my road to success, like many of us, has been fraught with bumps, twists, turns, and all along the road. I thought to be a success, you had to do it alone, had to do it by yourself just like those protagonists in movies and books. Uh, you hear stories of great successes and accomplishments, and you don't realize the many who were there to help support those successes. But doing it alone is not the reality of those who've achieved the great successes. As a leader at the college and in my life, I believe in being fair, honest, and caring. I get upset, I get frustrated, um, but I always ground myself in my roots to help me understand that it takes a community uh, to reach success. However, there's one important skill that I've never mastered, asking for help. I have always, even to this day, struggled with asking for help and assistance. It's not something I'm 100% comfortable doing. When I got my first job, my first job in my career in higher education, I had a supervisor, a director, a boss, who was absolutely amazing. She was everything you'd want in your first job. She was supportive, she had standards, she was a good coach, she was a good mentor and everything. As a matter of fact, when, we got our, when I got my first evaluation, the first evaluation I ever got, if you were to pull it out of the drawer of human resources office, you would think I'd be getting fired. It was, it was pretty bad. However, when I left that meeting, I felt so good about myself because she laid a path for success for me. And through that path, I never received a negative evaluation again. So when the time came uh, to move on to the next st stage of my career, I interviewed for a position at another university, and I was offered the position, and I accepted the position. However, I never told her that I was doing this job search. You'd think someone who I thought looked up to so much was such a great mentor I, I would work with, but no, I didn't. I did it on my own. When I went to her house that night, on a Tuesday night, and I remember this vividly, and it was like 20-something years ago, it was like 25 years ago, um, 
to give her to give my two weeks notice. And as an office, we were very close. So you know, I remember sitting down at her kitchen table. We were talking, and I gave my two weeks notice. I remember t describing the um, position I was getting, how excited I was, and everything. And she was smiling. And her first thing said, "Why didn't you tell me?" Why didn't you tell me you were applying for this job? She goes, Eric, I knew you weren't going to be here forever. You're far too talented for that. I'm thankful that I had you here uh, for the time I had you, and I knew you'd be going on to great things. You didn't have to do this alone, and that has forever stuck with me, obviously. Um, and it helped cement and laid the foundation for the type of supervisor and leader I want to be to my team. I want to be their community. I want to be their, their help. So as I juxtapose that lesson to you know, the book and Who Owns the Ice House, and, and it's caused me to reflect on my path and how grateful I am and thankful to those in my community who have surrounded me for I've learned from what I've learned and what I've been able to do. I still struggle with asking for help. I would rather take two or three hours to figure it out on my own, but I'm learning to work on and rely on those around me in my community because I know it can help me and it can help them be better and help me continue to grow. As I was writing my remarks, I was sitting there typing away thinking about how I wanted to say everything and make sure I, I honored the lessons and everything I learned. A student came to my door and said, hey, do you have a second? And I always have a second for a student. And she came in and said, I just want to thank you. And I was like, thank me for what? She goes, thank you for always being there for me. My family is not in this area. You're my community. You are, the, you are the one person who helped support me. And she had a difficult semester. And she goes, and I hope I didn't let you down. And I said, you have not let me down. You will never let me down. But I'm always here for you if you ever need it. Thank you. Our next speaker is a cosmetology student here at Daytona State College. Please welcome to the podium, Lana Campbell. Good evening. My name is Lana Campbell. I am an international student from South Africa. I've chosen opportunity to be my word today. I've always found that opportunity has crossed my path and every time I've tried to take in that opportunity. And school has been a place where I've always found the most opportunity through learning and um, guidance from our teachers. Hmm. My high school offered us an entrepreneurial um, day where you had to come up with cost and marketing of your product and everything, and through that, I saw opportunity of a product that my peers enjoyed but was not offered. So I marketed on that and I made a good profit. And then I did it for four years in a row and one of the years I was given an award, Entrepreneurial of the Year. Yay! I didn't get to take it home though. But also what my school offered, what was unique, it was a practical high school. We had needlework, hairdressing, and early child development as subjects in high school, alongside with all the other subjects that you required. And through that, I had found that I actually love hair, doing hair and making people feel good about themselves. And I spoke to my teacher about doing something towards it, and she said, go to a local salon and see how you feel about it. So I spent my holiday trying it, and I loved it even more, so I decided to do a career like that. Well, still in school and everything. And then I did it on my afternoons, and I enjoyed it. So then after school, I was given the opportunity to come to the US, and my grandmother lives here, and she said, would you like to go to cosmetology school? So I'm like, that would be amazing. But the timing wasn't right. So I decided to just keep on working in the salon that I was in. And through that, that boss unfortunately had to close his salon. But he gave me an opportunity to work in his other 
company, a motorcycle shop. It's a big change, and it was administrative, but I enjoyed it. And then he had a friend in a high-end salon, so he's like, apply to it, because he knew that was what I loved. And through that, I started to work at a company, a very high-end salon, and I worked there for three years. But then I noticed there was no progress within my peers. So I made the decision I needed to move on because if you're not growing, then where are you going? <laughs> so through that, I decided to travel again to the US to visit my grandmother. And then we came across Daytona State College and the cosmetology program. And it's a really amazing program. And through that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to apply. So we go to administrative and they say, you need a GED because you're international student. But if you're a normal US citizen, you don't need it. Yay. So I spent three months getting my GED. I passed it. And I was very happy about that. And through that, I had a lot of admin to do, but I made it. And I've been enjoying cosmetology and I've been learning a lot. And with this entrepreneurial mindset course, I've found a new source of education that I didn't see before. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today. And yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> So it's my pleasure to introduce a student in the Digital and Media Productions Department here at Daytona State College. Please put your hands together for Sherelle Thomas. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, you guys. It is so beautiful to see each and every one of you. I am so excited, and I'm going to do my very best here as I navigate properly. All right. Awesome. Well, my name is Sherelle Thomas, and I am a student, as stated, in the Digital and Media Productions program. And guys, it's been amazing. I'm so grateful to have my babies here with me today as my cheerleading squad, and I'm going to make it through this event. And I want each and every one of you to know that opportunities are truly once in a lifetime. What do you do with them? I wrote down a speech, but in my heart is what I want to share with you today. I started pursuing my college degree in 2018. 2017, I was challenging the GED program, and I had one last chance to pass the math test. And if not, I was going to have to wait another three months. You see, me and my children were homeless at the time, and I wanted something special to happen for us because it was important for me to do as I'd always done, which was provide for them. Well, I remember stopping at the Starbucks at Flagler. In Flagler, I had to take the test there because that was the only space open in December. And I called my god dad and I said, dad, this is it. And I only have this one chance because I wanted to get a job working at Frontier Communications and you needed to prove you had a GED or a high school diploma. Well, I left that Starbucks after studying for a few moments. And normally the past two times I'd taken a test, I automatically got a fail notice. So I was like, all right, fine, whatever. I drove all the way from Flagler back here to Daytona, and I remember stopping at the Taco Bell on Nova Road, and I got a notification, and it said, congratulations, you have passed. <laughs> that same day, I took my biscuits to Daytona State College and signed up for school, okay? Thank you. Now, the most important part of this story is I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do, so of course we started on our associates. I kind of figured out eventually I wanted to do music teaching because I wanted to give the opportunity for other children to have 
their gifts expanded and nurtured. I've been a minister of music since I was eight years old, and this was my passion. Well, April 17th, 2019, I had a stroke, and it caused me to withdraw from school. At the time, it was probably the hardest because I had my heart set on finishing. And being a mom of five, you kind of want to finish some things, you know, to be a, in the providing space and also to be that support system for them. Well, they became my caregivers, my nurturers, my cheerleaders. I'm grateful for them. They learned compassion through this journey. They've learned how to have more patience. And they've also got an opportunity to show what they're truly made of. After going through the closing of everything and health-wise, I wasn't sure what was going to happen for me. So this past winter, I got tired of kind of sitting down. I'd taken chances and challenged myself, being a business owner already, having an LLC. I've had two. And this new one that I established last year, I wanted to do something with it. And I knew it was helping others show up on social media. And I knew I wanted to have the opportunity to not just get a certificate, but I wanted a degree. I did my research, I asked my questions, and I didn't take no for an answer. Found out that there was a digital media program. I was like, that's right up my alley. <laughs> I was so glad to know that there was still an opportunity for someone like me. I knew that the classes would require me to come on campus. So this semester, I was concerned, but I knew that I do the best I could. I take one class right now, and I'm so grateful for Professor Moody, who has really been an inspiration in my life. I don't know if he knows it, but I'm giving you your flowers today, sir. I want you to know that you have motivated me to, to really push myself. I am now a full-time student, and I hope to finish in the next two years to finish my degree. I want to let each and every one of you know that nothing is impossible. What you set your mind to, it will happen if you do not give up. So thank you for this opportunity for me to share my story and for me to show each and every one of you that opportunities come once in a lifetime. Cheryl, I need you to stay put for just a second, all right? We're going to do a, a brief special presentation, everybody. So it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome to the front the founder of the African American Entrepreneurs Association, my friend Leslie Giscombe. Hey, Sherry. Ah, this is tough, guys. This is tough. Um, Sherelle, is that correct? Um, Sherelle called to uh, schedule an appointment with me yesterday, but uh, for somehow it fell through, and we were able to reschedule it uh, this morning. So I was on the phone with Sherelle at around 9.20 this morning, Sherelle, uh, for the first time. And um, I must say, uh, wow, um, there's no excuse. We have no excuse. Five kids determined not to give up. Um, on behalf of the AEA, Sherelle, we'd just like to provide this small grant. We call it micro grants. And you know, $300 is important because if you know the story of the, um, uh, what's his name, Steve Harvey, we know Steve Harvey is making millions today, right? But if you know his story, you know that it was $150 that he needed to get to New York because he got that chance to be at the Apollo. And he was 
knocking his head out. Where was I going to get that $150 from to get there? So these micro grants just say that we are supporting you on that journey. Uh, and on behalf of the African American Entrepreneurs Association, you got me in tears this morning, young lady. <laughs> and uh, you know, this is just the beginning. We're, I just want you to know that as an as a alum here, uh, this is where I got my start. Uh, to get back in my at, uh, academia and to uh, finish my degrees. And uh, I just want you to know that you're at a great place. This is where you're going to get the support. And I'm just glad that they were able to somehow lead you to, to us because we're going to be with you all the way. Okay? Thank you. Jarrell, congratulations. With that, we're going to welcome another DSC alumnus to the stage. Our next presentation is from a business consultant, Lori Ratto. First, I just want to say how honored I am to be among these speakers. I am truly touched and blessed to be here in your presence, and I thank you for that. So I didn't plan on sharing anything about my personal life as I spoke on knowledge, but I feel compelled to, to, to tell you, I was asked actually, why I picked knowledge as my word. I didn't really answer that question fully, but I'll answer it now. So I grew up in what I refer to as a very Southern traditional household. And we'll just leave it at that the opportunity for education was not there. Not only was it not there, it was forbidden because I was female. And um, so I went about life a different way. I did have a lot of successes because of taking opportunity and the choices I made in the business world. And with nothing more than a GED, I was a consultant for Pfizer Consumer Healthcare. I owned a company I, that was very successful. I had an international article written about my successes with the technology and the work and the project I did at Kennedy Space Center. I re-brought a company back to life, American Cash Register, brought it, it has closed down, it had zero in revenue, and I brought it back and ran it successfully for seven years. But knowledge and the being forbidden to go to school always was heavy on my heart. So I saw to it that my two children went through university. My son is a .NET developer, my daughter is an occupational therapist. And once they were completed and on their paths, I took myself to Orlando. I thought, well, I've already done everything in business. I'm going to go get a healthcare degree. So I, um, I'm going to learn how to do a thing in healthcare, work three days a week and relax and, you know, maybe work at a hospital and call it a day. So I did. I took an SAT test and I scored high enough to for UCF. I scored high enough for a few other colleges, but I chose to go to uh, Advent University of Health Science at Florida Hospital because I was going to be in the healthcare field. And so my first, at 54, I took that SAT and um, I enrolled at Advent Health and I did get my first degree from Advent Health and I learned that after working in a hospital for three years, that I am a business professional and I needed to be around my people. So I am back here. <laughs> I Googled um, project management and I found this program here at Daytona State and it was 100% online and I have zero regrets. I am so happy to be an alumni of Daytona State College with a bachelor's in applied science for their supervision and management course and also an advanced certificate in project management. And so now let's talk about knowledge. So at the very root of the matter, knowledge is basically information on a particular topic, right? So first we have data, just random characters, numbers, letters. This data doesn't really mean anything until we apply some type of identifier to it. And then once we identify the, the data, then we call it a, a body of information. And the person who learns this knowledge or obtains this body of information in project management we call him a subject matter expert. So we might ask yourself, is that the secret to being a successful business owner or entrepreneur is just gaining this knowledge in this particular area and being the best at it that you can be or that anyone can be? 
Well, when we look, when we talk about um, Clifton Talbert, the co-author of Who Wrote the Ice, or Who Owns the Ice House, and the Eight Life Lessons of the Unlikely Entrepreneur, he spoke of Uncle Cleve. And he spoke, he said that in order to get somewhere, his Uncle Cleve said, in order to get somewhere, you have to know something. So again, is that the trick? Is that, is that the one little thing we need to do and then we can have the successful business or successful life? But what he wanted to note is that his uncle didn't stop learning. Every day, he took the material that was available to him, which was newspapers and a few books, and he read them until he wore holes in that same information. So you might wonder why this person would go read something he's already learned. But the experience he had the day before brought new insight to the material he absorbed previously, and he learned new things from it. And he, he kept that mind open to learning. So uh, when I was um, principal owner and CEO of American Cash Register, my, about 75% of the customers were business owners, uh, the restaurateurs. Specifically, they owned restaurants. And what I saw during this time is that the person that knew the most about cooking, the, most, the one that could present the most well-prepared dish, beautiful in taste, texture, color, eye appeal, was not the most successful business owner. And sometimes the one who couldn't make a dish very well had a successful business. You might even hear his customer say or her customer say, well, the food's not that great, but we just love being here. So can we say that maybe there's a little bit more than gaining just that particular grain of knowledge in this, this area? Later on in my consulting business, I worked with a doctor's office. It was a husband and wife team, both doctors. And what they did, they must have read Ice House because they never left their home for the office until they read something about their field, whether it be case studies, latest technologies, once they had their minds prepared, then they went out and ran their successful business. So perhaps, and not just perhaps, the fact of the matter is that business owners, successful business owners, successful project managers know the importance of knowledge and they look at knowledge as something strategic, something strategic in that it's long term. It belongs to you. It's an asset that you gain that no one can take away from you. It is the sum of skills, experiences, insights, capabilities, and collectively, they make up the foundation of your business. So when we, as project managers, we look at um, knowledge in three categories, and there's a really sophisticated word we call those things. We call them business knowledge. And what business knowledge is, is explicit, tactical, and embedded. So first, there's the explicit knowledge, the knowledge we gain when we come to an institution like this that uh, is available to anyone who is willing to receive it. Uh, and uh, then there's the tactical knowledge, the knowledge that is born of pain. And if you haven't had this pain in your experiences, you haven't reached your full potential. So knowledge, um, tactical knowledge is the knowledge based on experience of repeatedly doing the same task, of learning how to improve that task. And then we have embedded knowledge, and now we're getting somewhere. Now, once we have this embedded knowledge, I call it the dot connecting knowledge, and, and so don't take my phrase, because I call myself the ultimate dot connector. <laughs> but. Um, Basically, in, embedded is connecting those dots. It's taking that knowledge that you learned and applying it to the, your experiences, and now you have something to really offer the world. And so when you do to that, when you take that embedded knowledge and you share it, it becomes exponential. It becomes powerful. And with that, it's exponential because it keeps increasing. The more you learn, the more you know that there is to learn. And then when you share this knowledge, it becomes power. It becomes powerful because knowledge shared changes lives. It explodes, it multiplies, it creates, it provides the ability not only to survive, but to thrive. 
with explicit tactical and embedded knowledge the values, the values, and that's what we're looking for, the values of our lives, our projects, our businesses exponentially increase. It's for the betterment of ourselves, for our clients, our customers, our products, our services, for our communities, and for even our world. So I leave you with this. May you never stop learning, and may you never stop gaining knowledge. Thank you. Our next speaker is a student at Daytona State College's cosmetology program. Please welcome Mariah West. Hello. Uh, my name is Mariah. As he previously stated, I was in the cosmetology program. Um, as funny as it sounds, at the time, I did not know what I was going to do in my life. And one of my coworkers came over to me and was like, hey, I'm going to sign up for cosmetology. Do you want to go with me? And I was like, eh, I don't know. And I ended up signing up anyways. Anyways, back to my word. I decided to use the word choice. I'm going to share a little bit of a personal story with you of certain choices that I've had to make. Um, so just buckle your seatbelts. I promise there's a happy ending. Just kind of buckle up a little bit. So... The word choice, the definition that I looked up on Google, is the opportunity to make a decision when given two or more opportunities. In life, I believe we make multiple choices every single day that we're not even aware of. Like, what am I gonna wear today? Or what am I gonna eat for breakfast? Choices will make the world go around constantly. In my life, I've had to make a lot of really difficult choices. Sometimes life doesn't give you the best deck of cards to choose from. Um, the story I'm going to share with you today is one of the most difficult choices I've had to make in my life. When I was a junior in high school, I met someone who I wasn't very fond of, to say the least. He reminded me of someone I had a lot of personal resentment towards at the time. Uh, one day, I ended up doing something I needed to take care of, and he was helping me with it, and something changed. He became a friend and a mentor to me, someone who I was very fond of and looked up to. As the next two years in my life flew by, I found myself talking with him and we were having a conversation. And in my head, I was thinking to myself, what is gonna happen if I lose this person? As weird as it sounds, out of his mouth, he started saying that he was gonna be there for me and we were gonna talk and we were gonna have all these wonderful memories after I graduated. Unfortunately for me, that was not the case. I found myself waiting by my phone pretty much every second to see if he still cared, and it never really came. Um, I would think to myself that I would think to myself that it's not really possible that this could happen. Like it's not gonna happen. He's waiting for something to change, and. It never did. I waited for, I want to say, about two or three years for this promise to come through for me. And unfortunately, it never really did. So I realized I had to make a really difficult choice. Either I had to wait several more years, pick myself back up, and try to maybe reminisce on some of the memories to get me through and wait to see if he's going to reach out and try to talk things out one day. Or I had to decide to move on with my life. I decided it was time to pick myself up, dust myself off, and walk away from the situation. <laughs> it was a really low point in my life because I didn't really feel like I had anyone who cared about me. And as weird as it sounds, in that rock bottom, I've learned this from the movie Sing because I deal with a lot of kids all the time, there is a quote that kind of stuck out to me, and it's, when you hit rock bottom, there's only one place to go, and that's up. Um, as funny as it sounds, it came from a cartoon movie that was a singing movie, whatever. Um, <laughs> so I realized I didn't need anybody to dictate my happiness. I was in control of my own life. I ended up 
joining cosmetology school. I love every second of it, every memory, every crazy comment that's ever made, every everything. <laughs> so I say to you again, choices make everything. Whether it's what I'm going to wear today, what am I going to eat for breakfast, am I going to throw this mannequin head across the room because I cannot figure out how to do this haircut, or if it is time to move on with my life. The choice is yours. I would like to take a moment as well to thank a couple of people. Um, my friends, Lana, Adrian, Stephanie. You guys push me every day. Drive me crazy sometimes, but I love you guys to death. And you keep every day interesting. My two best friends that are here, Lainey and Sandra. We have been through some things. We have, but you've been there through all of it. No judgment asked whatsoever. If I needed to call you at 3 in the morning to rant about something, you would answer the phone. Um, as well as Miss D for pushing me to do this. And my instructors, Miss Kim, who's not here, Miss Christine, who's not here, and Mr. Mike, <laughs> who I was not 100, to tell you a quick story, I was not 100% sold to stand up here. And in his words, I was voluntold. So, which means, in definition, um, in definition, that means I was volunteered to do it, but I was also told to do it. And so when I asked him, I pulled him aside, I'm like, why would you have me do this? And he goes, I would not make you do something I do not think you are capable to do. Which is why I decided to come up here. So thank you so much, both of you, for the opportunity. Thank you all. Our next speaker is a student pursuing an Associate of Arts degree at Daytona State College. Please put your hands together for David Morrison. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Teresa Rand for this opportunity to present on persistence today. Um, first, I have a quick story. Um, I called Mrs. Weem yesterday, one time. I called, no, actually Monday, I called uh, Miss McGee twice. I'm not too sure if she's here in the room. These ladies had no idea why I was calling them. Um, so, so I got dressed pretty much like I am now. Got my Italian uh, leather shoes on. Um, I have to come here every day because my wife is in the GED program. Um, so we, we, we came, I got my daughters and we came and we went upstairs and um, we were saying our goodbyes. And as I said goodbye, I look over and I see the big poster it says April 19th. So I had to go back in and say, babe, I'm not speaking until Wednesday. And my family got a, a laugh out of that. We got a laugh out of that. But um, maybe you're wondering why I chose to speak about persistence. Well, if anyone knows about being persistent, it's me. Persistence is the quality of continuing to pursue a goal or task even when faced with challenges, setbacks, or obstacles. It is an essential quality can lead to success in any area of life. When it comes to being persistent, you must ask, you must have an end goal in mind. What are you trying to achieve? What's the answer you're looking for? For some, persistence look a little different. For me, it can be daily persistence to keep going if I have not gotten the answer I'm looking for. Sometimes it's weekly persistence, Sometimes it's monthly persistence. It can be years of persistence. I would like to tell you a story about how 25 years of persistence have led me to this moment. I attended the University of Buffalo from September 1993 to May 1997, give or take a year. I basically failed out of college. After going back home to Rochester, New York, I attempted to attend school for many years without transferring the 100, 100 credit hours that I, that I earned at University of Buffalo. The reason I couldn't get those 100 credit hours, apparently I took some courses that I didn't pay for. Um, and if anybody's familiar with New York State, they're not giving you nothing free. So a funny thing happened after that, a thing called life, marriage and two beautiful daughters. I never, I never gave up on going back to school without those 100 credit hours leading, to, leading the way. So as I stand before you today, 
I will be attending Daytona State College this summer to take a few courses as well as in the fall and graduate with an AA degree. I will attend Bethune-Cookman University in the spring of 2024, where I will continue to pursue a bachelor's degree in business administration. Recently, I, I pivoted from selling custom basketballs wholesale to becoming a sports agent. I have clients, I have a clientele of basketball and soccer players that require this kind of persistence. When you are a sports agent, you always have to be persistent in finding the next opportunity for your clients. Professional athletes contract these days are for four years or less. So it's no time to rest. You have to stay on top of your game. In conclusion, persistence is an essential quality can, that can lead to success in any area of life. By persisting through challenges, building resilience, achieving success, developing self-discipline, and building confidence, we can achieve our goals and live a more fulfilling life. Never let obstacles prevent you from realizing your goals. And I leave you guys with one last quote um, to all the people in the room that's younger than me. Uh, when I used to misbehave uh, back in fifth grade in the South Bronx, my teacher used to say, spend your time wisely. So I say to you, spend your time wisely. Thank you very much. So we advance to our final in-person speaker of the evening, member of the faculty, he's assistant chair and a professor in the School of Business and Project Management here at Daytona State College. Please welcome Grady Meeks. We will all have opportunities to take persistent actions with appropriate knowledge in making choices that develop our brand and build our community to determine our wealth as defined by our value system. Wow. All right, is that like that? So I thank you, thank, thank my wife for that. So I'm doing a little summary of the takeaways for, for the thing. So Charles, his word was opportunity and his quote was based on where do we stand during challenging or difficult times or situations. And it reminds me of a wise saying that a good name is maybe better than oil at the day of death and the day of birth. So what do people think about when they hear your name? What are we doing during that dash in our lives? Stephanie's word was action, and she quote, reminded us to never let ourselves be defeated regardless of the defeats we face. She shared what? If we want something bad enough, we have to work for it. Faith Bryant's word was knowledge, and she shared the quote of how powerful education was in changing lives, positive change. And she reminded us that just because we passed that test doesn't mean we were a proficient, um, proficient driver, right? We had to drive. So another, another wise saying is the advantage of knowledge is this, wisdom preserves life of its owner. So if we have knowledge, we're driving that road, as Faith says, and we see a car coming right at us, all right? Understanding is if we don't do something, we might have an accident and might impact our life. Wisdom is getting out of the way so we potentially avoid that crash. So um, Michael, his word was persistent. And that was the key that allowed him to have the other life lessons manifest in his life despite whatever the challenging circumstances there were or the challenges with family life and work balance and even had to dis discontinue unhealthy uh, relationships. Uh, Laura Campbell, she was opportunity as well and she said it doesn't matter what other people are doing, it's what? It's what we're doing. Again, it reminds me of another wise saying is that as long as we have the opportunity, let us work to what is good towards all, especially with this community that we build. So take opportunities before us and do well with our community. And then Sherelle, the word was opportunity, remind us to be proud of who we are, right? And she asked if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you wanted, one moment, would you capture it or would you let it slip away? Again, reminds me of a wise phrase that if you become free, then seize the opportunity. And what did Sherelle remind, Sherelle remind us? We have to be the opportunity. And then Lori, her word was knowledge and her quote on finding strength in intentional, consistent, small actions. And realize that the more we learn, the more we realize how little we know and how much more we have to learn. So be a lifelong learner. And then Maria's word was choice and the quote remind us not to give up or wake up with regrets, nurture our community and take positive outcome. And 
Accept people who they are. I mean, when they show you who they are, believe them. Accept them, but place them where they belong. Because we are the CEOs of our own respective life. We hire, we fire, and we promote according to what? To our value system. And then David's word was persistence. It reminds us of his fifth grade teacher, to spend your time wisely. Mine was my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Templeton, and it was just on the same level. So in being persistent, what's your end goal? What are you trying to achieve? What answer are you looking for? And then with Dr. Eric, his was community. He reminds us we have to take strategic risks for the biggest achievements. As an entrepreneur and a project manager, remember that risk never sleeps. So we have to what? Capitalize on the positive risks or the opportunities and minimize or mitigate the negative risks or threats um, with that. So in summary, we have the power of free will. Like life is 10% what happens to us and what? 90% of how we choose to respond versus react, right? And don't be insane like Albert Einstein. Don't do the same thing and expect a different result. And this is a powerful one. I got this off Facebook. There were some good quotes on there sometimes. Think about this. Your smile is your logo, your personality, your business card. How you leave others feeling after experience with you becomes your trademark. That is a powerful sentence, right? So operate from your own value system, the golden rule, what? Treat others as they want to have done to themselves. Usually that's, it's respectful communication, but we all have different value systems. So we might want to treat others as they like to be treated, provided it doesn't compromise ours. And what's this? You've heard this phrase, and you heard it all throughout. Bad association, what? Spoils useful habits. Birds of a feather, flock together. Your net worth is equal to your network. So keep that in mind. And if you're the smartest person in the room, guess what? You're in the wrong room, okay? <laughs> so we now have opportunities to take persistent action with appropriate knowledge and making choices that develop our brand and build our community to determine our wealth is defined by our system. I wanna close with this, and I wanna thank my mom and my dad for the success I've had. Um, dad, rest in peace, mom is here for setting the example and, and embedding that in us. So thank you, mom. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Bowen. I am an international trainer for a skincare company, an esthetician, and an on-air TV beauty expert at HSN. Please, everyone in the room, if you can stand up, if you're unable to do that, if you can move your hands or just blink your eyes. Guess what? You just took action. This evening, that's what we've been talking about, right? Making choices and taking actions. So how and why should you act? I'd like to share just a brief story about myself as a child. I was labeled differently. I was put in special educations early on in elementary. Didn't fit in the traditional style learning. I wasn't in... I was unable to learn in the traditional ways. I didn't fit in that mold, traditional mold. And this carried on into my adult education life as well. I was spit on, I had to avoid confrontations, but later on when I resolved this, it was able to serve me very well. I was what you could call an ugly duckling. My feathers were kind of ruffled, some of them were missing, and I honked differently than the other ducks. Has anyone else ever felt that way? Maybe you've struggled personally, professionally, or with projects that you're taking on. Well, you're not alone. I felt that way. I had low self-esteem, acne, and that's what led me to the beauty industry. And so I decided I need to do something that I love where I can help others. So how am I going to obtain that? My parents were hard workers. And as I watched them struggle and build their businesses as entrepreneurs, one thing was clear. They worked harder than anybody else. So at my first job, when I was 15, I decided I'm going to be employee of the month. So I applied these four things that I'd like to share with you. One, always show up with your game face on, leaving everything else behind. Two, work harder than everybody else around you. Three, learn the skills you need to thrive at the role that you're trying to attain to. And four, take action and make things happen. Was this fast food job everything I've always wanted and my ideal career that I wanted to have? No, but I was able to take customer experience services away and use it in my other projects and goals that were going to come. With projects, we all know we have to pivot. So sometimes I had to leave that traditional formation that those ducks were flying in 
and I had to fly solo. After that customer experience, I took that and used it to have my medical job and I used it in that field. But even though I was in that care industry and I was helping others and that was wonderful, it still wasn't quite what I wanted. So I did a lot of side jobs to try to accomplish acting and things that I thought would benefit me to reach those goals I needed to do. Even one small action at a time, it made a difference. One of my nursing supervisors, her name was Sharon, she said, Amy, why are you taking on all these extra things besides your regular job? And I told her, Sharon, I'm going to be on television one day. And she said to me, Amy, that is never going to happen. Well, I'm here today to tell Sharon, thank you for being part of my motivation to help me be persistent in meeting the goals that I've really wanted to do, which is to this day, now over seven years, being on air television and traveling to help others do what they love as well. Now, I had many failed additions and it took a long process to be able to get to this and make this dream become a reality. But with this aesthetic background, I was able to utilize it and help others and still I'm able to do that, build businesses internationally. So never compromise your work ethics or your integrity and stand out as different, find your niche. That is what makes you the beautiful swan that you are. In summary, don't listen to Sharon. Sometimes you may still fly, not knowing exactly where this flight's going to take you. And you have to keep in mind the reason that you wanna complete the projects that you do. And every project will be different and you'll have to be flexible and pivot and take different actions each time. But this will help you improve and the next set of projects that you take will impact each and every one for the better success. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Buck, the author of Revealing the Obvious from Elephantine Press and available on Amazon. That makes my publisher happy. First, I'd like to thank Daytona State College and especially Teresa Rand for inviting me to Falcon Talks. As a Daytona State alumni, I consider it a great honor. Thank you. So, today my word is choice. Lately, it's become a politically charged and polarizing word, but that's only because it deals with the truth. The truth you can see and feel, the truth that's obvious to you. Either you choose to acknowledge it or you don't. It's a choice. In project management, you will constantly be faced with how to deal with what is so obvious to you. The truth, the efficacy of your leadership in project management will rely on your judgment based on wisdom, your understanding of it, and the data available to you at any given moment. It's, it's all very fluid. So how do you manage all those little flaming balls in the air and the kittens you must herd to manage them? Creatively. In fact, you must be ultimately and intimately involved with your own creative genius. The good news is that it's actually possible to be on intimate terms with your creative genius all day, every day. In fact, that's been the plan all along. But in the final analysis, it's already available to you 24-7, 365, right where you are, wherever you go, free of charge. Your creativity is part and parcel of who you are. You are creative. You were made to be creative. It's why you live. It's why you move. It's why you have your being. It's not something you do. We're not human doings. We're, we're, we're human beings. And as such, you can claim certain unalienable rights, such as the right to be intimate with your creative genius. No one can stop you. Only you can stop you. By being in touch with the creative genius inside, you come into perfect alignment with who you really are. It's obvious. The more transparent you become, the more the truth can be seen through you. Did you get that? The more truth that can be seen through you, the more obvious your life becomes. Things that seem so simple and obvious to you are not simple and obvious to others. That's why you're here, to share the obvious truth in all that you say and all that you do. Now, am I talking about becoming some kind of wacko, obvious evangelist, or an agile acolyte, or a waterfall cockatoo, or a hybrid cool kid? 
Absolutely not. The truth doesn't need a salesman. The truth is obvious. A good way to make sure someone is seeing the clear and undistorted truth of the obvious is to present the cost clearly, succinctly, and with no sugarcoating. Truth be told, the cost can be high. At some point, it may cost you everything. But the good news is that your perception of the cost changes with your understanding of the benefits. What seems expensive now doesn't seem so exorbitant when you're further along the way. The farther you go, the more you can see, the more you can see brings a perspective to your assessments that is not possible at the beginning. There are no shortcuts. We're talking about a change in your life that starts with a choice. A choice to change. A revelation of the truth that what you were doing before was less than optimal and that a better way exists and is attainable. The benefits? Inestimable. I'm still discovering them day by day. But the best part is the peace that comes from knowing that you have an unbreakable bond with your creativity. It will never fail you. It will never leave you. It is part and parcel of who you are. Coming into alignment with it reveals its benefits you, you never could have imagined. Each day brings a fresh sheet of paper and all the crayons in the big box. I wish I could convince every one of you that living the obvious lifestyle is the very best choice you could possibly make. But I can't do that. I mustn't do that. You must decide that, that for yourself, because in the final analysis, you will be held accountable for your choices, not me. Choose wisely, my friends. Reach out for that wisdom that is so very available to all of you. And once you encounter it, Embrace it. Make it part of who you are. Then you'll be walking in your creativity in unassailable authenticity. Now, what could be a bigger benefit than that?